Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. In today's video we're going to be taking a look at this. Uh, it's another thin client PC. We've got a WISE Z90D7. Now before we get stuck in, just a sort of fair warning, the hardware in here is kind of 2010-2011 vintage. So it's not the sort of retro hardware from the sort of 90s, early 2000s that we normally look at. However, we are going to try and do something quite retro with the software. So hopefully everyone will still find this interesting. Now, I say another thin client PC because about a year ago on the channel, we took a look at a Wise CX0 thin client and usual thing, had a look round it and um, think we upgraded the storage on it if uh, memory serves me right and turned it into a Windows 98 PC for my kids. The idea behind it being that they're only young and it served as something that was uh, sort of cheap, uh, robust, low power that they could just kind of have a bash on, have a play with and it would survive. Fingers crossed. And I'm pleased to say that's been a big success. I mean, it's in there in the living room just next door to where I am here. And, you know, a year later, they still play on that regularly. And not only did I want them to have some fun with it, I wanted them to kind of use it to get used to sort of using a keyboard and mouse as well as just touch screens like you get on everything nowadays. So it's been good at developing their motor skills with that. However, there's a couple of problems with that that I'd like to address. First up, my eldest is about to turn seven and he's getting ready for something a little bit more, a bit more advanced, you know, a bit more uh, to, for him to get his teeth into, as it were. On that uh, Windows 98 machine, I only install kind of simple programs and simple games. So think things like Hover, Chips Challenge, that kind of thing, or the, uh, the sort of plus for nine, um, Windows 98 plus for kids, things like the Paint It and the Talk It software from off there. So essentially, it's getting ready for programs that are a little bit more involved than that. And the second problem, as anybody who's got kids will know, two kids and one computer, the maths does not work with that. Don't get me wrong, I'm not naive enough to think that two kids and two computers works out any better, but what the heck, it gives us a good opportunity to do something similar with this. We'll have a rugged, low cost, uh, sort of low power PC, but, uh, you know, a bit more involved on the software side of things uh, that my eldest can play about with. And it'll be exclusively for them, or at least, you know, in the sort of, in, in the near term at any rate. So we'll take a look around this thing. We'll see what we've got. We'll see what makes it tick. If anything needs fixing, we'll fix it. If we think we need to upgrade anything, we'll upgrade it. And then we'll get the OS installed and get some software on. So let's take a closer look. Now the first thing you might notice about this is that we've got a Dell logo in the middle and I said this was a WISE. Well, it is a WISE, but in the 2010s, Dell bought WISE out. So we'll just take a quick look uh, on the front and I can do that without knocking the damn camera. If they get the camera to focus, you'll see that we still got a WISE logo here on the front. So Dell obviously wanted to uh, sort of keep that name brand recognition because WISE, this, you know, WISE were known for making these sort of thin clients. But um, Dell was starting to put their own branding on it as well, you know, given that they'd bought them out and they wanted to kind of start associating themselves with these sorts of things. Size-wise, the CX-0 is about sort of so big. So a fair bit bigger. We're going to have a bit more room to work with inside. I just grabbed the tape. It's about 22 and a half centimetres deep. Uh, call that 20 centimetres high and maybe five centimetres thick. So... Still really small, just not a, quite as small and compact uh, as perhaps some of their earlier ones. All passively cooled again, hence why we've got lots of uh, sort of slots and holes in the case for cooling. Taking a look on the front, uh, not a lot on here, we've just got the power button underneath the WISE logo. A couple of 3.5mm ports for headphones and mic in, and then two USB 2.0 ports. Nothing on the back, very much like the front. And then round the back, we've got DVI uh, out, a display port out, a couple more USB 2.0 ports, a couple of USB 3 ports, 
Gigabit Ethernet, barrel plug for the power input, uh, and a Kensington lock port. One thing that uh, one thing that is quite interesting, you see we've got this little plastic sort of flappy tab here. You pull this, you get um, all these sort of serial numbers and model numbers, all that kind of thing. MAC address of the uh, hardware that's inside. And on the other side, various logos and, uh, you know, things telling you don't throw it in the bin, this is who it's approved by, all that kind of stuff that nobody usually looks at. But other than that, it's got a plain, plain black case, really. I've got the little stand that came with it, so if you don't want to mount it in this kind of flat configuration, you can just bob it on the little stand. And I think, um, I think that's what I'm going to do this time rather than attach it to the back of the screen. Uh, for one, because it's a bit bigger, it's going to be a bit more cumbersome to attach to the back of the screen. But also, if you look at this picture of um, my, my work computer on my desk, you can see I've got a this Fractal Design node, I think it's a 202 case, um, quite a smallish case for portability reasons, but it stands upright um, in its stand on the bottom, and you can see this is almost like a smaller version of that, so so I think my eldest will really like that because it makes it look like dad's PC. Here's a little power brick that comes with it. Uh, no idea if this is the original. This is just the one that came with the listing. It's made by Asian power devices. Usual thing, multi-voltage, multi-frequency input. Output is 19 volts at about three and a half amps. And the little barrel plug is barrel, um, barrel positive like they mostly are now. And the input, it's one of the little three pin uh, clover leaves. So you just got your cable on there with a plug for wherever you are in the world. But yeah, overall condition of this thing on the outside, it's really clean. There's one or two very minor surface scratches, but not bad at all. And to be fair, you wouldn't expect it to be too bad because that little tab that I mentioned that we pull out, even though this uh, model was 2012 vintage, this one wasn't actually manufactured until 2015, so in technological terms, it's had a decent run. So to get in, it's nice and simple. You might be able to see there, we've got two screws here on the back, and then one screw there, and one screw there on the top and bottom respectively. Take those four screws out, and then this panel will slide off, and we can see what's going on inside. These screws, they're little tiny uh, Phillips screws. They're not posi drives, which is a shame. So make sure you get the right size screwdriver. Otherwise, you will strip these screws. You know, you'll um, kind of mess the heads upon them quite easily. So while I take these screws out, I just want to quickly give a shout out uh, again, just like in the first video, to the Parky Towers website. That website, uh, I'll try and drop a link down below, or if I forget, just Google Parky Towers. It's an absolute treasure trove for information on thin clients, not just for this WISE, for all different manufacturers and models. So if you want to learn more about this one or any of the other thin clients, have a look at that website. Um, it's a fantastic resource for these. So just pull the cover back like I did there, lift it up, and there we go. First thing that strikes me about this is just how sort of bare bones it looks in here. If you look online for pictures of this particular model, you'll see on a lot of pictures it looks a fair bit busier. I'm guessing with this being um, a 2015 build of this model, they'd perhaps done a lot of sort of integration or cost saving uh, on this board, hence given us a sort of more bare bones look uh, that we've got here. So underneath this heatsink, we've got an AMD G-T56N dual core CPU. It's one of their kind of low power, highly integrated CPUs and the, uh, the GPUs built into that too. Got two cores running at a maximum of 1.65 gigahertz and the graphics built into that, that's a AMD Radeon HD 6320. So again, nothing special by modern standards. Heck, nothing special by 2010 standards, but um, it'll be more than enough uh, for what we need. 
And when this whole thing is running, Y's quota, so sort of typical running power for all this of just 22 watts. So even with that dual core CPU and graphics built in, it's still not using a ton of power by any means. So in the bottom corner, we've got the coin cell type battery. So no worries about leakage or anything like that, which you damn well expect for 2015 vintage. We've got a uh, serial ATA port here with a little sort of uh, flash based disk on module again, where you've got the SATA interface and the power interface all built into the one connector. I think that's uh, an eight gig module. So definitely going to want to upgrade that eight gig doesn't give us a huge amount to play with uh, you know, for sort of this level of hardware. Mini PCIe slot. So if you got the one of these that had the built in uh, wireless card, that's where the wireless card would have lived with a couple of cables going to some cutouts on the back for the antennas. This PC is not going to be going on my home network, neither wired nor wireless is going to be no internet access or anything like that off this PC. So no problem not having that. So we've got two DIMM sockets, um, just the one populated at the minute. That's a two gig stick of DDR3. I think this supports a maximum of four or eight gigs of RAM, but again, two gigs is going to be plenty for what we're going to do with it. And other than that, not a whole lot. You've got a second SATA port here uh, if you want to use it, but you'll have to pick power for that up from one of the other places on the board, one of these other headers, for example. A couple of connectors down here. These, uh, there was an optional, uh, I think it was like a legacy port uh, option you could get for this. So you got a load of legacy ports built into the back panel, you know, so think PS2, serial, parallel, that kind of thing. Again, obviously I've not got it, uh, which is no, uh, no big deal for what we want to use this for. But if you did, you'd have some cables connecting into these. So other than that, not a lot to say about the insides. Now, the operating system that I'd like to put on here is going to be Windows XP. Now, when these things came out of the factory, they ran Windows 7 embedded. And the 8 gig, um, 8 gig disk, it was fine for that, obviously being a thin client, just the kind of lightweight front end on here, and all the info stored off on a server somewhere. Since I want this to run as an actual PC, we're going to upgrade this disk uh, to something uh, to something bigger so that we can store everything here locally on the PC. Now, I don't know if we're going to be able to put Windows XP on here. The hardware might be just sort of too new for it, but we'll give it a go and, and then we'll see what happens. If we can't do it, then we'll have to have a change of plan and think about a different OS. But just like with the CX0 that we looked at, this kind of low power hardware, you never get anything like the kind of performance you would expect out of an equivalent sort of processor, or at least not just thinking in terms of clock speed anyway. Take that wise CX-0, it was running at one gigahertz, which you think, wow, for Windows 98, that's a huge amount of uh, CPU speed. But because it was one of those low power via Edens, I think it was, it's not equivalent to like a one gig uh, you know, AMD Athlon or a 1 gig uh, Pentium 4, it was maybe about half that uh, if you've been uh, generous. And it's the same with this. So because I want this to be an actual PC, just like with the CX-0, this is why the hardware kind of looks over specced on paper, even though it isn't. But in doing so, it gives you that problem of, can we get this newer hardware to run the older operating system? So first up, before we even get that far, let's take this um, little disk on module out and I'll show you what we're going to put in to upgrade with. Quick note, it's the same as before, single screw and it's another Phillips screw. So same, same screwdriver that took your case off, we'll take this out. So there's our little module that came out. Uh, now you can see it a bit better. You can see you got that standard SATA ports for data and power. Now, we could just put another one of these in, uh, but it does mean then that we'd have to look for something specifically sort of this type of size. And the problem with looking for something that's the same size to replace that is that you're limiting your sort of options in what you could fit because you can't put anything in here that's too much longer because you'll bump into these capacitors uh, here on the motherboard. So 
since we've got all this space to work in, I don't see the point in limiting us just to trying to find a little disk on module that's uh, that size and will fit in here. So, what we're going to use instead is this. We've got a 60 gigabyte Kingston SSD now 300. You know, just bog standard two and a half inch um, SSD. We've got a uh, normal SATA connection there. Um, cost me just ten pounds for this uh, off eBay, brand new. Is it genuine? Who knows? Um, I hope it is. I've had this connected to my main PC and written about 55 gigs of data to it uh, just as a test. So it certainly seems like the uh, capacity is there. But I guess time will tell, uh, you know, fingers crossed it's all okay. To plug it in, I'm going to use one of these uh, sort of combined um, SATA extension cables. We've got a male end and a female end, so get one end down there on the board and the other end uh, into the SSD. So in terms of mounting, we've got plenty of space. I think I'm just going to use something like those sort of 3M, uh, you know, sort of removable uh, sticker things that you can uh, that you can get, and I'm going to. I'll hold it to the um, to the actual outside panel and just sit it somewhere there. It's not really going to be obscuring anything. And when uh, when the foot's on, this is the base, and I'm going to have the top up here. So any heat generated from the processor that's going to want to go straight up that way. So it shouldn't affect any of the cooling uh, or anything like that. And then all we've got to do when we take the side off, it just pop the cable out the end. Right then, got the SSD installed and all the covers back on and got it on its little stand. Uh, that all went absolutely fine. Did have to put the SSD uh, sort of uh, portrait at the back here rather than landscape across the front. There just wasn't quite enough room due to there's a little protrusion on the inside of this cover that was uh, blocking it. But that's not a big deal. It won't change anything. Bit of a shame you can see the sort of white um, sort of sticker thing here. Maybe I have to move that up or see if I can uh, get a black one or something like that. Just so it's not quite so visible, but not a big deal. We can get this thing, um, you know, get the software on and get it all working. Another slight annoyance is with the Binno audio ports uh, on the back, I've uh, had to connect the monitor speakers onto this one on the front here just to check it's all working. Certainly when this is in use, one of those little 90 degree 3.5mm plugs would be useful there, just so it's not sticking out quite so much. Other than that, got a screen on, power connected, all that kind of stuff. Um, no legacy ports, so I've had to find a USB keyboard from somewhere, and I've got a USB mouse as well. Got uh, an old IntelliMouse uh, Explorer 3.0, one of my all time favourite mice that is bit rattly and old now but uh, I think it still works we'll check and as I mentioned we're going to try and install Windows XP uh, this here is an XP professional service pack 2 I think uh, service pack 2 will be plenty for this we don't really need service pack 3 or anything that brings I mean we don't really need service pack 2 but I've got this uh, disc so we'll use that but on Service Pack 3, the sort of system requirements started to uh, shoot up a bit. So uh, since we're trying to keep this uh, quite a light install, given you know the sort of limited hardware that we've got, this Service Pack tool will be fine. I'm going to plug in a, a USB CD-ROM drive. I uh, think it'll be able to boot from that. We'll soon see anyway, because this is, since I've got the disk, this will be the easiest way to put it on. If not, we'll have to try making a bootable USB stick or something like that. Right, we'll grab a CD-ROM drive and start installing the OS. No noise, of course. Been completely fanless. That's really, uh, really nice. Oh, straight away, look. It's picked up the uh, USB CD-ROM drive. That's spot on. Right, I'm not going to go through the whole rigmarole uh, of showing you the installation of XP. I think the install will be fine. As I said earlier, it's more going to be about whether we can get drivers and uh, whatnot to get all the hardware working properly. Um, but yeah, you don't want to um, watch me uh, you know, sit here and install XP. So I'll do that off camera and we'll come back in a minute.
Hmm, looks like this isn't going to be quite as straightforward as I hoped. Had this blue screen error come up, given it a restart, exactly the same errors come up at the exact same place, so uh, obviously I need to do a bit of digging into this and try and figure out what the problem is. So as you can see, we finally got there. We got Windows XP installed on this thing, but it's not been easy. This whole process has taken me over a week now, so apologies that this video is coming out a bit later than, uh, than I would have liked, but this is just how things go sometimes. So you saw there, we had that uh, blue screen with the IRQL uh, not less than or equal to blah blah blah, whatever it was. That took quite a bit of solving and I ended up sort of going, you know, one step back before taking two steps forward. Search on the internet was saying that that was perhaps down to um, the disk controller mode in the BIOS. So, you know, on, a, on AHCI rather than IDE. So try swapping that. That didn't work. The other thing it said was it might be down to faulty memory. So I thought, OK, got myself uh, my USB stick. Um, bootable version of mem test on here and then I let it test the RAM and this picture just shows uh, it after the first pass but did all the passes no problems uh, with the RAM at all. So then when I came to try installing Windows again and I can't remember if at this point I was still on the CD drive or if I'd put Windows on the USB stick as well I plugged it into the rear USB ports, which sounds innocuous, but it caused me another problem. Let me explain. It started installing, and now I got a whole new blue screen of death that I didn't have before. And I'd tried different versions of Windows XP, I'd tried different disk controller modes, I'd tried all sorts, and it was only when I was swapping about between all these versions that I just happened to plug the, uh, the USB stick back in the front uh, USB ports on the machine. And then I finally got back to the original blue screen with the IRQL not less than or equal to blah blah blah. Now, the rear USB ports on here that I were using are the USB 3 ports. Now, obviously they're not going to function at USB, speed, uh, USB 3 speed, but this should still work as USB ports, and it looked like they were. Windows XP was installing and getting part of the way through, so it was obviously copying files you know, off the stick or the CD drive, and it was, you know, it was working in that sense, but for whatever reason, when I was using those ports, it was just crashing. And yes, I was trying to slip, uh, slipstream drivers in and for whatnot on the installation. None of it worked. Anyway, when I realized that was my sort of fixed to the new problem, I stuck to using the front USB ports, which are USB 2 ports, and then all I had to solve was the original problem with the IRQL not less than or equal to. Anyway, various problem solving with that, again, re revolving around different versions of USB, i.e. SP1, SP2, and SP3, and so on, and that disk controller mode, and it was only with the combination of the disk controller being in IDE mode, and again, tried slipstreaming drivers in, that would not work. So, disk controller in IDE mode, and with XP Service Pack 3. And then finally, the damn thing installed. Now, I didn't really want to use X, uh, XP Service Pack 3 because of the uh, sort of increased system requirements, but if it's the only one that works, that's what we're going to have to stick with. So, apologies for the long-winded explanation, but as I say, been over a week now uh, on this, so at least we got there in the end. Now what I am pleased to say is once we've actually got Windows XP on here, it's been plain sailing since, you know, no real problems. We had four unknown devices here in Device Manager. One was the uh, USB 3 controller, one was the Realtek uh, HD audio, one was the uh, Realtek uh, gigabit network controller, and one was the, um, the, the built-in graphics, the HD6320. Now, all those drivers have been uh, easy to find, just searching by, you know, the PCI uh, vendor and number and the hardware ID, 
that identifies the drivers, easy to get them, and even for Windows XP, even given when this thing was designed and made, sourcing these drivers, piece of cake, they've gone on, they've worked first time. So they, that's really good. So it turns out we can run Windows XP uh, on this hardware. Now I'm not going to go into much detail about Windows XP in this video. It's not really what this video is for. But if you do like a bit of Windows XP, just to let you know, it might be the next video or the one after on the channel. Not sure which yet, but I've got a really interesting Windows XP sort of thing coming up. So uh, yeah, if you like a bit of uh, Windows XP, stick around for that one. But what about this system? Well, let's just uh, quickly put it through its paces. Uh, we're going to start with a bit of 3D Mark um, 06. I think that was the last one specifically written for Windows XP. I think the one after kind of had Vista in mind. Now, I'm not expecting miracles here, and you know, not by a long way, given that, um, you know, given the, yes, the hardware is much newer than 3D Mark 06, but it is very low power, you know, given the I can't remember what I said, was it about 22 watts or something like that for this system? So I'm going to drop the resolution to say 1024 by 768. We'll uh, let it run through its tests and we'll come back and see what we get. So there we go, 2,867 3D marks. So not exactly setting the world on fire with that one, but we were never expecting it to, you know. I mean, 3D mark, those sorts of programs, they were always intended to really push the hardware. And although, as we keep saying, it is newer, it is very limited hardware in here. If we look into the details, though, there is one interesting thing that uh, comes out of this. Now you can see the uh, frames, uh, you know, for the graphics uh, tests here. All right, again, not a lot, but you know, we're talking eight frames a second, twelve, fourteen, etc. But then you look at the CPU score; we're getting point three and point five frames per second. I mean, literally flip that on its head. We are in seconds per frame territory there. Now, I don't think this CPU is, is that slow. I think there's maybe one or two possibilities here that's causing that really low CPU score. Probably the most likely of those possibilities is there's either something with the architecture or maybe a particular feature, you know, that's missing from these CPUs that those tests relied upon. And either that or the, dip, or the newer architecture is sort of completely confusing it and it's, it's not using the CPU properly because... It's not that slow, and certainly even for a low power chip would not have been that slow by um, 2006 standards. Or perhaps less likely, maybe this thing's throttling thermally. I don't think it's doing that because the tests that were run before that and the tests that were run after that, they run at a sort of consistent frames per second. But it is something that I'm going to look into uh, a bit more after, I've, after this video has gone out. If it is throttling and there's plenty of room in here to fit a slimline fan, I'll post a little follow-up video, uh, you know, if that's the case. Uh, just, but as I say, I'll look into that, see whether it is. Let's try, uh, let's try a game from um, the sort of Windows XP period. Um, let's go for the old favourite Unreal Tournament 2004. We meet or exceed the system requirements for this, so it should run pretty well on this hardware.
Right, there we can see, that was running uh, really well. We were averaging probably, I don't know, 60, 70 frames per second in there. Um, if we just have a quick look at settings, you can see this is running sort of normal to high details, 32 bit color, 1024 by 768 resolution. So in terms of playing those sort of earlier Windows XP games, uh, you know, that sort of 2002, 2003, 2004 time period, absolutely fine on a machine like this. It'd make an ideal little low power Windows XP computer. What about something a little more modern? Let's jump forward to 2007 and let's try and answer that modern day can it run Doom? Can it run Crisis? Now we're below the minimum recommended processor speed. It says XP wants a 2 GHz or faster CPU. We're only at 1.65 but it is a much more modern CPU and we need 256 meg of video card memory. Well, the built-in video card, uh, you know, the video chip in here just steals half a gig of RAM. So we've got 512 megabytes. So we're okay on that. Obviously, we're not on the list of officially supported uh, chipsets because this wasn't out there then. But hey, this is a kind of 2010 chipset. So can it run Crisis? No, no, it can't run Crisis. Perhaps best to avoid um, those kind of demanding games from 2007 onwards. Still, worth a shot. So what about using this machine for the actual purpose that I was built, to, you know, for, for, for uh, my eldest kid? Well, yeah, it's absolutely fine for that. As you can see here, I've got the children's Encarta on from 2005. Uh, it's going around these, the articles, the games, all that kind of stuff. Works absolutely no problem, as you'd expect. And I've got the Windows XP version of Microsoft Plus on here as well. So, you know, we've got the little plus games and the themes that they like messing about with. And, you know, the kind of slightly more kid-friendly software for playing about with photos and all that kind of stuff. So obviously I'm going to take Crisis and Unreal Tournament off here. I'll put some more games on that are, you know, both period appropriate for the PC and age appropriate, um, uh, you know, f f for my kid to play about on as well. And in terms of that, this little Wise is going to be absolutely perfect for that. You know, it's really sort of low power, as I've said before. So if he leaves it running for ages, forgets to switch it off, whatever, it's not using loads of electric. It's barely cost me anything. I think I picked it up for about £22 off eBay in the, here in the UK. All I've spent is um, £10 on that SSD. And if we have to stick a slimline fan in there, I mean, that's going to be what? Another £5 at most, something like that. I'm going to do the same as I did before. I'll get an old um, an old screen for this. I've got plenty of old pairs of speakers. Um, you, know, you can have one of those so uh, we can get a bit of sound out of it. And I'll find him a keyboard and mouse. That won't be a problem. But yeah, I think he's really going to enjoy this. I think it'll allow him to kind of take his sort of playing with computers up to the next step. Further than uh, I could do with that Windows 98 machine that I made. So that's where we are going to leave it for this video. Um, yes, we could install Windows XP on here and I think this, uh, these sorts of age and hardware spec terminals, I think they make great little Windows XP machines. I hope you've enjoyed watching this video. If you have, give us a thumbs up, subscribe or you know, a comment down below, all that kind of good stuff. But for now, I'm just gonna say thank you very much for watching and we'll see you in the next one. Bye bye.